Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, boa tarde, todos e a todos, and welcome to SDSN Brazil Annual Conference. The theme of today's event is Rio Plus 30, the transformation and education since the 1992 Rio Summit. And we will discuss the progress towards the implementation of the SDGs from the perspective of the transformations that happen in education, academic curricula, research, and technological developments following the historic Rio 92 Summit. Uh, before I proceed, I'd like to let everybody know that we have interpretation from English to Portuguese. You just need to click on the globe uh, written interpretation at the bottom of your Zoom and select the language you want. Uh, eu gostaria de avisar a todos e a todas que a gente tem tradução para português. É, e para isso você é, precisa só clicar no ícone, ícone de globo na parte de baixo do seu Zoom, escrito interpretation, uh, e selecionar o canal de português. Um, moving with the agenda, we are honored today to have an incredible group of speakers. Uh, the event will begin with Professor Marcelo Gattaz, Gattaz uh, Vice Rector of, for Development and Innovation of PUC Rio, and Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network for opening remarks. We will proceed with Dr. Rodrigo Medeiros, member of the Executive Committee and former chair of STSN Brazil. Uh, and uh, Rodrigo will talk to us about uh, Brazil's past, present, and sorry, SDS and Brazil's past, present, and future perspectives. Uh, after that, Dr. Alice Guimarães, Director of Global and Regional Projects and Initiatives at GIZ, and Dr. Leonie Grotten, uh, Grottenguth, Knowledge Management Specialist at GIZ as well, will be brief us on the Regional Fund for Triangular Cooperation with Partners in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, following that, Dr. Patrick Paul Walsh, uh, who is the Vice President of Education and Director of the SDG Academy at SDSM, will tell us about the global impacts and importance of partnerships for transforming education for the SDGs. And last but not least, Dr. Marta Garcia Haru, Senior Manager of the National and Regional Networks at SDSM, will talk to us about the importance of partnering with the private sector to achieve the SDGs. We know this is a really comprehensive agenda, so we'll have a five minute break at 1 p.m. New York time, 2 p.m. Brazil. Uh, and we will return to hear from Dr. Oscar Molina Terrerina, Chair of SDSN Bolivia on SDSN Bolivia and Universidad Privada Boliviana, followed by Dr. Monica Pinilla, Assistant Director of the SDG Center for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Sonia uh, Neve, Program and Outreach Coordinator of SDSN, to tell us about SDSN's USA's experience in mobilizing university. Uh, Dr. Tassio Mauro de Campos, Chair of SDSN Brazil, will provide us with closing remarks. Uh, I would like to remind everyone to please keep your microphones off during this event. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Marcelo Gattaz to the floor. Uh, Marcelo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me just set up here. Uh, for, uh, I hope everybody's seeing my screen. Uh, first of all, it's an honor for Puki Hiu to have you to host this event. Uh, I should take this opportunity to briefly mention a few facts about PUC. I think most of you already know our university. So we are a nonprofit organization in Brazil and uh, with a very nice uh, uh, vision and mission. That's to, that it's, I will just skip those things because I want to get to problems more interesting. Uh, what uh, probably most of you know Puki by at least that's why I usually find when I'm going abroad and people know Puki by the that's the university where the where the economic department for example in 1994 was able to reduce the inflation to with a very uh, important program and that's how most of people know our university some people know our university also by this for almost 40 years of uh, work we have been doing with the oil business 
people sometimes tend to think that this was a sort of a dirty business sort of thing. It's not. We work very hard to prevent accidents, to save lives, to preserve the environment. And that's made our uh, history a very successful history. We didn't have many, uh, we didn't appear much in the press, but uh, uh, UKI is now one of the first universities in the world regarded to transfer of knowledge to its size. UKI is a small university, has 12,000 students only, but uh, it has a very huge impact in, in, in projects. Our budget for projects is uh, exceeds our budget for tuitions in, in, in great proportion. We are also a university that are now very inspired by the, the Laudata C uh, uh, encyclic that uh, has all this care about the planet, also by fraternity. So we lately, we, We've been doing a lot of uh, developments in the energy transitions. Right now, we have about $75 million in projects for energy transition. So we are doing a lot of different things. I'm not going to go through those things because those are, but from carbon sequestration up to new fuel, to future fuels that in, and, 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 many other initiatives in this, in this area. And finally, I would just uh, point out that we are now going to, we are creating a new project in the universe, which is called Amazoniza. This project is uh, aimed to the forest preservation, to respect of Q culture and local people, and to promote projects for repun. What we are basically intend to do is to uh, <clears throat> use all our connections that we already have with big industries and, and, and international corporations to be a hub for uh, companies, universities, scientific institutions to promote a sustainable development in the Amazon and pres widely preserving the environment and the culture of the native people. This is very important. Uh, it's a very tough uh, 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 project that we are undertaking now with the support of the Vatican. Uh, and it's basically uh, has uh, the cooperation of, uh, have already have the cooperation of uh, many important institutions, uh, including the Jesuit institutions, which is planning now to create a special university in Amazon. And we, we are here now to provide support and to help in all those questions from research, from from, for example, for anthropology questions of how you should, what kind of, of subjects and teaching should we give in an Amazon? How should we approach uh, the, the exploration and the economic development there? All with this vision of sustain, with sustainability. So this, uh, we are also have big projects for uh, our Rio de Janeiro, especially focus on, on Gavia Valley, but that's more a, a cultural, social program. That is, we want to become an engine, local engines here for, to help this. Uh, Puki is, is, is located in a very nice place and with uh, some community favelas as we are known. And we want to work in the social integration that that's more inspired by the loud out to see. I won't go into all of our projects because I'm just uh, in the place here to give you a uh, welcome and to say that we are here and very glad to be part of this uh, SDSN. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marcelo Gatas. Uh, it's really interesting to, to hear about the projects that Pukis is undertaking. 
Um, we can take uh, one question from, from the floor now to Professor Marcelo Gattas. Um, I, sorry, uh, let's just check. So uh, I see that we have one hand raised from Adriana Leras. Um, unfortunately, we cannot, uh, I cannot give the space. Oh, I see the rent is down. So if you have any questions for Dr. Marcelo Gattas, you can put your question on the Q&A box. I will give just a few seconds. And if we don't have any questions, I believe we can proceed with the agenda. And if you have a question later for uh, Professor Marcelo Gattas, we can come back. Okay, uh, since I don't see any questions at the moment, uh, we will proceed uh, with our agenda. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs uh, told us that he's a little bit late, so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rodrigo Medeiros, member of the Executive Committee and former chair of SDSN, uh, to talk about SDSN Brazil, past, present, and future uh, perspectives. Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isela. Uh, I don't know if, if you're seeing my screen or, or you can hear me. We can hear you, but we don't see your screen. I see okay, you. I'm not, yeah, you see okay. me. That, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I'm not sharing any, any, any slides. It's, it's just more a uh, storytelling. I have 10 minutes to talk about, I mean, the SCN in Brazil, past, present, and future. But first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, Professor Sachs, that in, in a few minutes will be with us, and Professor Gataz from PUCI. Uh, whom I greet here on behalf of all participants on this afternoon. My name is Rodrigo Medeiros, and I am a member of the Executive Committee of the SDSN Brazil, and it is a great pleasure for me uh, to be with you all on this first day of the forum, 2022 forum, uh, talking very briefly about the past, present, and future perspectives for SDSN Brazil. A little bit of history, SDSN Brazil was officially launched in March 2014 here in Rio de Janeiro. And as uh, it was in other countries, it was established in Brazil uh, from the graduate program in sustainable development practice uh, at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, which is part of the global network of masters in sustainable development practices created a few years ago by Jeffrey Sachs. And I'm pretty sure that my friend uh, Paul Patrick, Patrick Paul will tell a little bit more uh, too. Um, at the first moment, uh, it was a work done in close coordination with my dear friend Emma Torres. I think that she's uh, also with us on the forum uh, too, and which initially brought as a partners, uh, in addition to the Federal Rural University itself, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, the Pereira Passo Institute, and Conservation International Brazil. At the time, the Pereira Passos Institute acted as the uh, first executive secretariat, secretariat for installing the network on the, the first month. And after that, uh, the system of rotation of offices that we have until today uh, was established. Uh, and then we have the Brazilian Foundation for Sustainable Development, the FBDS, acting as the first secretariat between April 2014 until March 2015 then followed by Conservation International Brazil, who was the home for SDS in Brazil from April 2015 until March 2019, when Pukihiu took over as uh, its new secretariat, March 2019. Uh, and this creation of the SDS in Brazil, given the context at that time, uh, it was defined that the main objective of SDS in Brazil uh, would be to present solutions for sustainable urban development with an exclusive focus on thematic group nine. Uh, this group was called sustainable cities, inclusive, resilient, and connected. And uh, this thematic group, it was one of the 12 thematic groups originally de uh, designed by the SDS in global and uh, with a focus specifically on the implementation of the SDG 11. Uh, here in Brazil. 
the work uh, carried out by the network at the SDG 11 left an important legacy for the metropolitan region of Rio de Janeiro through different projects and studies that were carried out by the network during this period by, with several network members with the support at that time of the Secretariat, but also by the GIZ uh, and so. Uh, but in 2019, uh, the transition to Book Hill allowed allow us uh, to evaluate the work uh, we carry out by the network until then and led us uh, to an important change at the time start to work not only with uh, own SDG, the urban SDG, but start to work with all the SDGs in the countries, in the country in Brazil. Uh, in this new phase, now I read to speak a little bit about the present and about the future, the challenges are very great. Uh, as many of you probably know, unfortunately, Brazil uh, in recent years has distanced itself from, has moved away itself from a project, from a project with a uh, vocation for sustainability, that is what we've been through in this past, I mean, especially this past four year. Uh, and the escalation of deforestation in the Amazon and the Cerrado and the disrespect of rights of indigenous people in Brazil uh, are just two examples of, of, of this. Um, now here in Brazil, we are a few days away from a historic election, presidential election, that will define the future, not only of Brazil, but certainly of the planet. I'd like to repeat here the title of the editorial published yesterday by the Nature magazine that say in bold uh, letters. There's only one choice in Brazil's elections for the country and for the world. And that's why what's going on in Brazil right now, it's very important, not only for Brazil, but for the entire world. But I recognize that whatever the result may be next Sunday, the day of the uh, second round of elections in Brazil. It is certain that SDSCN will play a very important role in Brazil, uh, whether in the reconstruction and resu resumption of the SDGs agenda uh, in the country, uh, in an eventual and more than desired new government, or as a pole of dialogue and resistance if the choice Sunday leads us to continue, to continue uh, the current government's project. Um, finally, um, I want to point out that the creation of all the work of SDS in Brazil over these almost eight years now uh, was a result of collaborative work that involved dozens uh, of people in addition to the more of, uh, by now, I think more than 50, 50 members uh, in institution uh, spread across different states uh, in Brazil. Uh, but thus, it, it would be very difficult for me in this short space of time to name all the people who were important in this process. Um, and then otherwise, I would really fail to mention people who were very important in this genre. And there will be a lot of people that make uh, uh, as the as, as in, uh, in Brazil make tribe. So instead of, I mean, uh, mention a, a list of people, uh, I would like to just uh, to pay a tribute to my dear friend, uh, Luis Felipe Guanas, uh, a professor at Puki Hill for over two decades, and to who I had the honor to hand over the coordination of SDS in Brazil in, Tuntai in 2019. Uh, Felipe uh, was a friend and a partner who was always close to the network and since the beginning, first as a member, since the foundation of the network in 2014, and of course later opening the doors of Pukihiu so that NIMA, uh, our now a sustainability nucleus in Brazil, coordinated by him at PUC, could be the new home of SDSCN. Um, uh, Sadly, Philippe left us uh, very, very young, uh, right after a terrible pandemic that all of us I mean, have been through in these past years. And we are very sorry that he's not here with us to enjoy and celebrate this moment today. Uh, but we are sure, and, and I can say that, I mean, on behalf of my colleagues from the executive committee and, and all the people involved with, uh, in, in the uh, managing the, the, the network in Brazil right now, that we are sure that his joy and passion will always be alive in our memories and will serve as an extra motivation for this new phase of SDSN in Brazil. Uh, I, I would say that the achievement of the SDSN Brazil project that he helped to build 
uh, more closely in this past, I mean, four years, uh, which foresees a fairer and a more sustainable world, definitely will be the best way for us uh, to honor his memory. Uh, so thank you all. This is a very brief, 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 brief history of, of about the SES in Brazil. And I wish you all an excellent forum. Head back to you, Isabella. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you for this overview on SDS and Brazil. Uh, and as a, uh, an alumni of the Masters of Devel Development Practice in the Federal Rural University of uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, this has a, it's a soft spot for me. <laughs> uh, you have great uh, professions, great professors working there. And thank you for your words about Felipe. He's definitely uh, missed, he's dearly missed by all of us. Um, we have uh, two questions, one for Professor Gattas and one uh, to you, Rodrigo. So for Professor Gattas, uh, we have a question from Carla uh, Kinierin. I uh, should like to know uh, what are the ideas for extension programs in Pukihio. Uh, and Rodrigo, um, we have a question on how do you see STSN Brazil medium to long term goals aligned with the pressing decade of action? I didn't get the question. Can you just, uh, Isabella, can you just uh, repeat it for, again, please? Uh, sure. It was a question about uh, extension uh, programs at Pukihio. Well, the, 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 I don't know if, if I got the, 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 the intent of the question. Uh, the, 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 we have a, a continued education program, which is... Uh, uh, active and we intend to increase the, the, the activity, but also we have, uh, uh, we are, understand the extension of the university institution as more is this participation of the university in projects around the uh, environment. Uh, uh, Maurice, you say that you are not hearing me, is, is that the problem? Uh, is everybody, uh, listening okay uh, yes he might be in the in another channel okay so yes the, we 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 if the question is regarded to the amazon initiative and 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 and, and the gavia valley initiative those are projects that are, are starting we already have this uh several parts of the universe several projects inside of the university, but we are now uh, trying to, to promote uh, a sort of a global uh, action inside of the university in this direction. So I, I hope that we will have extension programs for that too. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gattas. Uh, Rodrigo? Yeah, thank you for, for the question and um... I don't want to be pessimist because I, I'm not at all a pessimist. I, I really optimistic, but we all know that, I mean, we are running out of time for the climate agenda and the SDG agenda. Uh, 2013, 2030 is, is, is around the corner. And especially in Brazil, we definitely uh, got, get, got behind in this past four years uh, due to the lack of leadership and all of the circles that uh, happens here. But I truly believe that, I mean, networks like SDSN, SDSN that really puts people to work together and make the difference, I mean, and make you know, some, some way to advance and move forward quickly, uh, that agenda will be uh, more than important for Brazil right now. Then I say again, that we really, speaking of Brazil, of course, we really uh, to wait until Sunday to see the elections results, to see what kind of strategy uh, uh, we will have to put on, on the ground, because uh, definitely there are two different proposals on the table right now submitted to the Brazilian population um, uh, on the ballot uh, Sunday. Uh, but whatever, as I said, it is the results, uh, definitely a network like SESCN working along with other network and others organization and universities in Brazil, it will be crucial uh, whether to help to accelerate implementation of solutions uh, to advance the SDG agenda, whether to be, as I said, a piece of, a piece of resistance 
of uh, uh, to avoid uh, a bigger disasters that will feel not only for Brazilians but the entire uh, world. So it, it it is for me. I'm I'm very glad that we, uh, despite all the uh, we've been through in Brazil, we're here today, gathering a lot of people interested on on the SDG issue and 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 willing to do something and willing to work. As I said, no matter the results on on, on Monday, we have to deal with that. And the best way to deal with that is continue to work. Uh, to, I mean, build and to create a better uh, planet for everybody. Thank you, Federico. Uh, yes, that's, that's great. Um, I would like to now give the floor to Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me join. And if I can, uh, I want to show you where I am. Now, I don't know if you can see the flag. The Brazil Embassy. But it is the Brazilian Embassy indeed. Uh, I am happy to be in Piazza Navona, beautiful Piazza Navona. Uh, and uh, we are standing fittingly right in front of the Brazilian Embassy. Um, and I hope that that means uh, not not only your leadership, but also that we can count on Brazil's leadership in the days ahead. And as we just heard, I think the elections uh, on Sunday are of crucial significance, obviously for Brazil's future, but also for the world's future. Uh, if uh, things turn out well, and I'm speaking just on my own uh, part, because I'm a great uh, admirer of President Lula, I think that the added leadership we'll get in global sustainable development will be absolutely amazing. You know, in uh, the past year, SDSN has been supporting the science panel for the Amazon, uh, and Carlos Nobre uh, has done a magnificent job in leading Amazon-based scientists from all of the eight Amazon Basin countries uh, in this wonderful collaborative effort. And President Lula has been asking Carlos Nobre for advice, for help, for strategies uh, going forward. And one of the things that uh, President Lula said on, on the campaign trail is that if he is elected, uh, he will launch an initiative, not only for the Amazon rainforest, but to link together the three great equatorial rainforests uh, of the world the Amazon Basin, the Congo Basin, and the Indonesian Southeast Asian uh, equatorial rainforest. Uh, he called it the BICS proposal, not the BRICS, but the BICS, meaning Brazil, Indonesia, and Congo. That's thrilling. Uh, it's an example of what we would expect from uh, President Lula and from Brazil's leadership. There's another reason why Brazil's leadership can play an absolutely huge role, and that is the G20. <laughs> of course, Brazil is an important member of the G20, but especially important member in the next two years. Uh, in 2024, Brazil will host the G20. That's a big deal <laughs> because it gives Brazil a, a lot of influence on the global policy agenda. But it's even better than that, because the way the G20 works is a so-called Troika process, whereby in any particular year, three governments cooperate closely. The government that preceded the uh, year in hosting the G20, the current host of the G20, and the future host of the G20. So in 2023, with Brazil in line to be the 2024 president of the G20, and with Indonesia being this year's G20 president, we will have a troika of Indonesia from 2022, India as the host in 2023, and Brazil as the upcoming presidency in 2024. Now that's a powerful combination, Indonesia, India, and Brazil. That's a real opportunity to help reset the global agenda for the interests of the developing countries and for the interests of sustainable development. It would obviously bring 
two thirds of the BICs into the Troika, Indonesia and Brazil together. It would bring three countries that have a lot of geopolitical weight and a lot of call over the years for social justice and a lot of demand for reform of the international financial system together. One of the things that we know is needed for the Amazon, but more generally for sustainable development, is to shift the pattern of global finance towards Um, I believe we lost. Uh, and uh, oh, can you hear me? Sorry, I had an incoming call. I was saying one of the <laughs> recognized needs of uh, the uh, SDGs is to shift some meaningful part of global saving, which is about $27 trillion each year worldwide, to increased SDG based investments in the low income and lower middle income countries or in the developing countries more generally an extra <laughs> or additional trillion or even $2 trillion of investments in the developing countries. That's manageable. It's about 2% of world output. It's about 8% of world saving. But that's the shift that we need. And that is what the Secretary General of the UN, Secretary General Guterres, has called for in an SDG stimulus where he has appealed to the G20 countries, help redirect some meaningful part of global saving for the SDGs in the developing world. And I'm working with the Secretary General on that and helping to think through institutional mechanisms to tap a larger fraction of world saving. Well, frankly, I'm very excited, a little nervous, but very excited for Sunday and especially for Monday, assuming we have good results, which I'm counting on, the chance to really make a difference in the global financial architecture to finance the basic transformations in education, in healthcare, in green energy, in sustainable agriculture, in nature-based solutions, in urban infrastructure, and in digitalization of services and economies in the interests of uh, inclusion and uh, sustainability, we're going to have a real opportunity to do that. And uh, I'm counting on Brazil's leadership. So just want to say it's nice to be standing in front of the Brazilian embassy here in this beautiful square, this Piazza Navona in Rome. Uh, it gives me hope. Uh, it gives me confidence that we're going to be heading in a very exciting and dynamic direction and it's going to be coming very very soon so thanks a lot for letting me join you good luck on sunday please go out make sure you vote and everybody else that you know votes because you're voting for the future of brazil and the future of the world thank you so much thank you jeffrey uh, thank you for telling us about the bigs the g20 and how the SDG stimulus are possible uh, we have two questions on the chat for you. One is from Vagno Trompete. Uh, he's asking, besides puc are there other universities or public sector engaged in Brazil uh, with the SDGs? Can you cite a few of them? Well, SDSN Brazil has lots of members throughout the country. So I think, uh, yeah, please, SDSN Brazil, make sure that everybody knows how to join, how to participate, uh, how to increase engagement. There are so many important institutions in Brazil, uh, universities, federal universities, uh, state universities, uh, think tanks, national laboratories, great research centers. And one of uh, Carlos Nobre's ideas is to establish a new center for the bioeconomy in the Amazon itself. So a new one that we're going to be hoping to found. But please make sure that everybody in Brazil knows how to get involved. Thank you, Jeffrey. We also have a question from uh, Patricia Marinho. Uh, Patricia is uh, <laughs> saying that the Northeast of Brazil asks for help. 
And she's asking if STSN has anything planned for, for us, for the Northeast of Brazil. She's talking from Porto de Galinhas e Pojuca in Pernambuco, one of the biggest tourist destinations in the world. Thank, thank you very much. I, every country needs a national strategy that has regional development focus within it. Uh, and so the Northeast of Brazil has many special features, many particular needs, many special opportunities as well. Again, I'm afraid that the government has not done its job in recent years in creating that sustainable development framework, but I think it is what is going to be on the way. And in that context, uh, I hope that uh, SDSN Brazil could help uh, the Northeast, which, which does have a lot of special needs, a lot of beauty, uh, a lot of uh, tourism, of course, uh, incredible culture, uh, to develop SDG-based development plans. And with this SDG stimulus, there should be an opportunity to increase the flows of finance for investments in the Northeast. We're doing that in Colombia right now, because in Colombia, the Caribbean region and the Pacific coastal region, which are Afro-Colombian communities, uh, have, of course, for a long time, uh, been far behind other parts of the country in development and in access to public investment. And so we've been working with the government on developing a new large scale investment program on a regional basis for these uh, regions that are behind the other regions in infrastructure and physical access and so forth. And the Latin American Development Bank, in this case, the COF, is going to lend long term funds to the Colombian government directed specifically at those Afro Colombian communities. So this is an example of regional based development with financing coming along with it from the COF. And I think we could think creatively about a similar kind of strategy for Brazil's Northeast. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for your <laughs> answers. And uh, now we will proceed with the agenda. Uh, I would like to invite, I, oh, sorry. No, just to say goodbye uh, to everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good, good luck on Sunday. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jeffrey. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, so now I'd like to invite um, Dr. Alice Guimarães and Dr. Leoni Grotegov uh, to talk about Regional Fund for a Triangular Cooperation with Partners in Latin America and the Caribbean. Alice and Leoni, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Isabella, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here today. Um, maybe I'll just briefly start and I will try to uh, share my screen. I hope that you can see it and that it works. We can see it. Perfect. Yes, so my name is uh, Leonie Grotegut and I work for GIZ, the German Corporation, and more specifically, the Regional Fund for Triangular Cooperation with Partners in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we are here today to talk a little bit about one of our one of the projects um, between Brazil, the Palestinian territories, and Germany um, on mitigating the effects of the pandemic through innovation, renewable energies, and greening vocational education for a more employable youth. Um, so I just want to briefly jump in um, by presenting uh, the regional fund. And for those of you who, who aren't familiar maybe with the instrument of um, triangular cooperation, those are triangular cooperation projects that are jointly planned, financed and implemented between a soliciting, a pivotal partner and a facilitating partner, in our case, Germany. And um, it's projects that can provide flexible, innovative and contact adapted solutions to concrete development challenges of partners. So that is sort of um, what is our goal as a fund. We want to strengthen triangular cooperation, as you can see on the slide, for national and global development in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. And we promote both the TRC projects and also uh, focus on capacity development. And um, our goal is to be partner oriented in our implementation and contribute to global and of course regional development goals such as the Agenda 2030. 
And so far, so we have been commissioned by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development since 2011. And we have promoted um, the German uh, part of the of 170 RC measures um, with 33 partner countries so far in 11 different uh, sectors, with uh, 36 projects currently being implemented. And we work through two calls for proposals per year in April and October. And um, if you want to learn uh, more about the fund or the modality of triangle cooperation, I would invite you to um, just go on our website or directly reach out to me. And uh, just as a final point, um, I wanted to mention that triangular cooperation um, is an instrument that contributes to all of the SDGs, such as SDG 4 with, in quality education, as my colleague Alisi will present the example in a, in a few minutes. Um, and in our understanding, this is mostly due to the flexible nature of the, of the instrument, because it operates openly and unrestricted and is fully oriented uh, towards the demands of partners. But um, saying this, it is also important to underline that there is a focus on strengthening, particularly SDG 17, as you can see on this slide, uh, focusing on strengthening partnerships to reach the sustainable development goals. Um, so we have been trying to establish the fund as a platform for knowledge sharing and peer-to-peer -peer learning on triangle cooperation and of course on the development solutions. And um, yeah, as you can see, especially on the indicators 17, 17.6 and um, 17.9. And of course, um, BAPA plus 40 was also instrumental to putting into action this 2030 agenda by calling for more and stronger partnerships, not only in the public sector, but also with um, multi-actor partnerships, such as with civil society organizations, research institutes, etc. And so this is also something that we are promoting through Triangular Corporations to really join efforts to further expand our networks of partners, um, connecting countries and um, partners from different regions um, in search for yeah, fulfilling our global commitment to sustainable development and the reduction of inequalities. And now I want to hand over to Alisi to um, get into the project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonie. I am Alisi Guimarães from GIZ Brazil. Um, first of all, I am very glad to be here in this meeting. Uh, we had very interesting discussions before this uh, presentation. I would like to highlight that I am here also with André Barros. Uh, André Barros is from the Brazilian Agency of uh, Cooperation and uh, GIZ Brazil is working with ABC since in trilateral projects since 2010. And if you want also address some questions to the Brazilian part of this trilateral projects, you can ask him directly. So uh, I will uh, speak a little bit about this project that began at the end of 2020 that is called Renewable Energies and Greening Vocational Education for a More Employable Youth. Uh, the duration is two years. The estimated cost is 720,000 euros and 300,000 are from Brazil, 300,000 from Germany and 120 from from Palestine. The requesting institution uh, is the National TVET Commission in Palestine and uh, also participate the ABC, as I told, the Ministry of Education of Brazil, MEC, the Ministry of the Education of Palestine, the National TVET Commission in Palestine, the Palestine International Cooperation Agency, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, and the GIZ. Please, Leonie, can you pass? Okay. Uh, this project wants to advance the state of learning and teaching renewable energy in Palestine and strengthen the cooperation between the private sector and TVET institutions. TVET is technical and vocational education and training. And the most important is of this project is the interchange of knowledge between Brazil. Uh, the Palestinian territories and 
Germany. Uh, we here in Brazil we have a very advanced system uh, that includes uh, the private sector and the planning of the courses and so on. And this is the most uh, strong in the project. And and yes, the first thing, of course, it was to see or uh, to to research the needs of the Palestinian labor demand to see which kind of professionals professionals in in this uh, photovoltaic area they need, uh, and then select courses in Brazil that will be used as a starting point for knowledge transfers between the two countries and supported by additional advice from Germany. Uh, Furthermore, exchanges between the world of tech teaching and learning and the world of work will lead to institutionalized forums that shall benefit the sector in the long term. What we are doing and we already did is uh, to sit on the same table, the private sector and the teachers and, and try to find uh, very specifically the needs of the private sector for professionals. And we are doing this uh, in Palestine and also here in Brazil, of course, but uh, we do this together in Palestine now. Uh, of course, we will also work with the regulatory framework um, and, and all of these are the, the main points of the, this project. The next one, Leonie. Uh, the outputs of this project is basically revising, revisiting the approach towards photovoltaic energy and governmental, technical and vocational education, both in Palestine and Brazil, and also in Germany. Establishing a dialogue of stakeholders on harmonizing the framework in energy, education and economic sectors in Palestine and research, uh, and also to foster the research in Palestine, considering the experience from a project uh, with, between MEC and GZ here in Brazil. There is the program for development in renewable energies and energy efficiency in the federal ne network, ENERGIF. Here, uh, we try to link some of our indicators, the indicators of the project with the SDGs. And as you can see, we have different SDGs that, you, that we can uh, link with what we are doing. The first of them are the 17 that Tony already told is the most important uh, SDGs, I think, for all the trilateral or triangular cooperation because it's about uh, partnerships for the goals. And I think that this is a strong mechanism to, to achieving such kind of partnerships. And here, uh, our first indicator, uh, indicator speaks about joint applied scientific research processes between Brazil, Palestinian Tibet institutions and Brazilian counterparts, which will uh, foster this 17 indicator. I think that I will not enter in the, the indicators of the SDGs because we will not have sufficient time, but I hope this presentation will be with you and so you can see. Leonie, you can go. Oh, you are having some trouble? Let me try to, to jump in. I don't know how to do this. Let's see. Uh, here. No, I can I can hear you again. Sorry. <laughs> yes. No, it's the, the next slide, please. Yes. Is it? Can you see it? Yes. Now, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. The other indicator that we have is that at least two new TVET programs are offered by TVET institutions in Palestine. And this is related with uh, the SDG of quality education, the SDG, and also here the, the SDG of industry, innovation, 
uh, an infrastructure because, uh, of course, uh, this indicator is related also to the resource use efficiency, uh, greater adoption of clean and environmentally uh, technologies, and this, of course, will uh, will uh, foster the the industry. Uh, the next one is the most uh, direct with this project. There is the SDGs of quality education. We have also one indicator that at least 40 teachers and trainers, including all existing female teachers, there are not too much, but we will include all of them, and trainers were addressed in theoretical and practical training in the field of renewable en energies by multipliers who received inputs through this project. Uh, in July, we were in Palestine with two teachers from the, the federal institutions, the EFES is here in Brazil with, with the Ministry of Education, and they did uh, a training for these multipliers for a lot of teachers uh, that will work as multipliers of this uh, training in Palestine. Uh, the, the last one, Leoni. Yes, also, of course, uh, the SDGs about uh, the SDG about affordable and clean energy, uh, all of them are related with this, this indicator. And one of them is also that we will upgrade three labs for vocational training in the field of renewable energy, uh, specifically solar energy in the project. And of course, uh, with this project, we are trying to uh, to spread more the solar energy, the use of solar energy in the Palestinian territories. Next one. Yes, this is some of, of the pictures of this uh, two weeks uh, that we passed in Palestine, making this first interchange between uh, Palestinian teachers and Brazilian teachers and professionals. And uh, now I will try to summarize some of the lessons learned that we already have. The project uh, is in the middle and we will uh, have more lessons to the end, but we can uh, find some lessons to share with you. Uh, what we saw, the project began in the pandemic, so it was very hard the first months to really set the the environment of trust between everyone. Uh, we are speaking about very different countries with very different different cultural backgrounds and different languages, Arabic and Portuguese. And uh, but what we saw uh, with this first mission is that uh, it was really, really uh, meaningful for each one that was there. And we could uh, set a very confident environment after uh, this meeting. So our lesson is that uh, it's important to build a confident environment to better de develop the project. And presential meetings are fun fundamental at the early stage of the project to build an environment uh, of trust. From my perspective, uh, we can do a lot of good things in virtual meetings, including capacitations and learning and so on. Uh, but there are some things that uh, we still need the, the presential meetings uh, to really understand the other side and have the best uh, relationship possible uh, to reach jointly the goals of a project. Uh, the other one is that each country is different and they have their own time and in the trilateral projects we need to adapt and be flexible to find a joint way to achieve the project goals even when things are not the way that we are 
that we planned. It's important that both sides know each other's education networks, how they work, how the partnerships are to get a good implementation and make it more effective. So we, we have to do, we had to do a series of studies before beginning the capacitations to uh, also have this, this knowledge shared. People who are going to provide the trainings must know the whole project and the conditions at the demand countries. Uh, it's not sufficient that we are planning with only uh, the people that are more in the, in the management of the project. We need to really have the teachers also uh, inside and that they know uh, the whole thing to, to better implement their part. Uh, try to obtain a maximum of information about the country and its needs before planning the training. I already told that. Uh, and here is a photograph of a practical training that we did there. And one of our lessons is try to provide more practice in the trainings, align the theoretical contact with practice. Um, practice. Alice I'm, I'm sorry, but we, we need to wrap up the session. Ah, so if okay, you can, okay. Yes. okay, no, no, that's it. Uh, I think that the, the most important is to say that uh, no matter the difference, no matter the difficulties that you had at the technical level, when you put together the technical level in different countries, they will uh, find a way to join efforts and to, to work together. So this, this, I think, is the most important. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you, Leonie, for telling us about uh, North-South cooperation and this exchange between Brazil, Palestine, and Germany. Uh, we will move uh, now with the next panel. And I will uh, collect the questions for all of the panels at the end. Uh, so now we will proceed with uh, Dr. Patrick Paul Walsh. Uh, on the global impact and importance of partnerships for transforming education for the SDGs. Patrick, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Isabel. Um, I can't turn on my camera. It's uh, the host is not allowing me. Are you stopped me? Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so uh, again, thank you for the, the kind invitation today. Um, so um, first of all, Rodrigo, is, uh, Rodrigo, I remember um, we were on the steering group of the MDP in the initial days, but one of the big things we did was um, set up the International Conference on Sustainable Development. And that was actually 10 years old today. And I was thinking of you uh, when we were reviewing that. Um, so it's excellent to be on the call with you today. So. Let me know that you can hear me properly and that you're seeing my slides. Is that we good? can hear you and we can see your screen. You're good. Ah, okay, excellent. Um, so hopefully I'll get to the topic, uh, the importance of partnerships for transforming education. So I, I will give a little bit of a summary of the, the test the GA meeting that happened about a month ago. Um, so I'm Patrick Paul Walsh. I'm I've been with SDSN and, and the SDG Academy as a, let's, let's say, a, an external advisor um, for many years, but I've decided to go into operations and I'm on a secondment from University College Dublin, now uh, Vice President of Education and uh, Director of the SDG Academy at, at SDSN. Uh, we do have an annual report, so if you want to take a, sh a camera shot of the code there, you can download our um, are, are the current one for the activities that we've done during the year. So the things I'm going to mention now, maybe you might want to read in more detail. Um, you can do that by looking at the annual report. Basically, there's three things we do. Um, we do content, which I'll talk about uh, first. Um, so the Academy puts together, um, let's call them MOOCs, our massive online courses, and our key one, we have other platforms in different languages, but the key one is edX. This is the MIT Harvard one. Um, and we have been doing this since 2014, and there's some very successful um, um, online content there. That's what's called an open, open education resource. And of course, you know, Jeff Sachs's Age of Sustainable Development or Rockstrom's Planetary Boundaries or 
uh, that to see e e e e ethics in action. Um, there's lots of very popular courses and Isabella would be um, former MBTP student uh, will be delighted to hear that we're going to do uh, a MOOC on the science panel for the Amazon, but she 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 probably knows this, of course, um, she works on it. Um, but so one thing is content. Um, the next thing we do is, and I won't go into a huge detail, is we build out on that content. So we have, we're starting professional training for teachers and corporates. We're starting uh, professional training for governments. Um, and also we're doing uh, online master's degrees, both in UCD and Sunway, and we're starting to do micro masters um, uh, and so on. Uh, so if you're interested in any of these issues, we're more or less learning how to do this and to do it well. So if your university wants to get involved in any of these things and have your course up in edX, et cetera, on this with the SG Academy, let me know. Um, we also are involved in what we call communities are uh, practice, which um, the Masters of Development Practices, um, which is a wonderful group of people um, uh, teaching, uh, coordinating and working on the on what we call the MD, the Global Association of Masters of Development Practice Programs. Um, and they've been there for a long time, I guess about 10 years, um, and they produce some wonderful graduates like Isabella there, et cetera. And I'm sure there's about seven or 8,000 of you at this stage. Uh, we also run Global Schools, which is more about uh, mobilizing teachers in schools across different countries. Um, and uh, the next thing I just want to talk about, I'll talk, I'll talk about Mission 4.7 in a minute, because that's another, uh, we're a secretariat to that initiative as well, which I'll talk about in a sec. I just want to frame kind of education or the work that we do, um, or what we should be doing in terms of what I'm going to call the global knowledge commons. I know in this, so there's this very short, article in a in a magazine that's this is the international association of universities under unesco um and they have this uh, uh the quarterly magazine um this this paper i just tried to con condense my kind of world view of this um so in the end you know we do need uh my intuition is is that the knowledge we have to create a safe place uh, for for humanity um, and, and for nature um, is really not enough. We're well inside the frontier. Uh, and the problem with this is that a lot of the knowledge is concentrated a little bit in well-resourced, let's say, universities or research centers, and then we have a lot of under-resourced. Um, but there's three things that really have to happen, and I'm sure SDSM Brazil is working on it, and we all are, is the first thing is that the knowledge that we create, and when I mean knowledge, I'm talking about you know, research papers, education resources, data, policy briefs, and so on. Um, you know, it's not always free to access, you know, but there's paywalls, and it's not always orientated to the public good. And, and that is a problem. Um, so one of the key things that we should be focused on is UNESCO's what's called open science recommendation and their open uh, resource recommendation. And these recommendations are as close to a legal agreement as you can get amongst governments, and everyone has signed it, except the US because they're not a member of, of UNESCO, but we all should be working hard and helping each other create um, the knowledge that we need for the SDGs. And it's a lot of work to do to get, to get SDG courses and curriculum going, uh, the different degrees to get the research, get the policy, get the data going. And we all obviously have to work together on this, right? The second thing is we also have to be aware that we have to build capacities in universities in the global south. So we're really not doing our job if we're not transferring and disseminating our knowledge and twinning and partnering. And the project before this uh, was showing uh, the importance of this. And finally, we do have to take responsibility as universities and higher education institutions to actually come out and, uh, if you like, um, disseminate our work and to help corporates, governments and NGOs actually uh, implement the SDG agenda. Um, so rather than being passive and letting the private and government and civil society come in on us, we, all, we have to basically mobilize ourselves and take a leadership role in implementing this agenda and take actions to do this for corporates, disseminate into policy, into corporates and into civil society. So they're the, the big jobs. Um, to do. Uh, SDG Academy is a secretary to mission 4.7. Um, so this is uh, 
a network which uh, Global Schools and SDG Academies Secretariat for, but is set up by the Ban Ki Moon Center, uh, UNESCO, the Center for Same Development from the University, the Pactivical Academy of Science and Social Science. Um, and the idea here, it's a very nice target in SDG 4. This is the whole idea of um, global citizenship or lifelong learning that we all have to understand how we coexist with nature and coexist with humanity all around the world um, to have empathy and understanding all across the world. And it's a key driver of peace and sustainable development. But there's a lot of work to be done to ensure from preschool all the way through schooling into university, lifelong learning, that there is indeed uh, participation uh, in, in um, sustainable development education. And in a sense, that's the challenge of transforming education. Um, so I've just explained this, that, um, you know, we, we, we have the young learners who we want to, from preschool to, to learn through their schooling, sustainable development education. But unfortunately, most of us have not got that in people inside universities have not got it. So we have our leaders in corporates and governments and civil society without sustainable development education. So this is a problem. So upskilling, if you like, start, starting at the top of the ladder is as important as the bottom of the ladder in terms of upskilling people on sustainable development. And that's why Mission 4.7 uh, is talking about the continuum of education, lifelong uh, from preschool all the way to end of life. Um, universities can be a part of this, right? Um, it's not a, yes. Patrick, sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, we are uh, running a little bit uh, out of time. If you can wrap up, that would be great. Okay. You. Um, so you can, I'll tell you what, I'll give you my slides and you can have a look. Um, so the only message I, I wanted to say is that education, if you don't put money and effort into education, you cannot achieve any of the other transformations. Uh, the problem is, is that the depth and scope of education is extremely weak. We're putting no money into it. Uh, so the SDG stimulus could be very important that Jeff talked about. I also summarize what the Transforming Education Summit has six calls to action, a very big focus on finance, a very big focus on the, the digital transformation, and I explain what exactly they're going to do with the digital transformation. You can have a look at the, these are the commitments that were made um, a month ago by, by global leaders. And then finally, we, I show you a project that SDSN is running on implementing the OER uh, recommendation by UNESCO, uh, which is just pleading with academics, with their learning management systems, their curriculum, with their data research, to put it in repositories, put it into open uh, licenses like Creative Commons licenses, uh, make sure you can put a property right on it, but it can be used for free all over the world. It can be updated, reused, translated, and we all have to work together, you know, within and across nations to create this knowledge for sustainable development, or for sustainable development, and that's why education is so important. I'll stop there. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, that's uh, really interesting, and I'm sorry to, <laughs> to interrupt us. I'm sure you have many other uh, interesting projects to, to tell us. Um, I think we can open for two questions and before a quick break of five minutes. Uh, and yes, we have a comment from Aure Carvalho to you, uh, but it's not a, a question. And... Uh, hello, uh, she was in my class last year in Harvard Extension School, so <laughs> I hope she's doing well. <laughs> it, uh, so we have uh, one question for uh, for you. Uh, it's will more SDG Academy materials be available in Portuguese, and how can SDS and Brazil support this progress? Yeah. So basically, what uh, it's just what I was saying in the last project is it's our material is up in edX, but that has curves, as we say in technology, right? So what we want to do is get all of this down in repositories and into a thing called Scrum and put property rights on it and put metadata on it so that people can pick and choose the content that they want and create their own course. And of course, the best thing you can do is to translate it uh, into, into Portuguese or add your own case studies and add your own interesting points. So I call it create your own teddy bear. Um, but we have a little bit of work to do to get that repository up and running and, and to get it financed. Oh. But uh, this is one of the big projects we're going to do in open edu education research, uh, research. And of course, it's vital that people are able to update and translate and repurpose uh, and to add their own uh, content uh, to reflect the local context, because 
uh, this is the best way that we can share uh, open education resources, but that is our aim. And this is all in what's called the open education resource recommendation, which is from UNESCO, which is really worth reading uh, because this is exactly its, its mandate. All governments have said they would do this and support this, including Brazil. Uh, so it's time for people to actually the academics and curriculum providers to do this. Thank you, uh, Patrick. We have one question to uh, to Alice and Leoni. Uh, so uh, who are the players involved in the energy partnership from Brazil and what are their roles? Uh, I already write, wrote, <laughs> but okay, I can I can tell you also. Uh, my video is not uh, turning on, so I will only speak here. Uh, the the participants from Brazil, the participants from Brazil are ABC as the coordinating agency for all the Brazilian technical cooperation, the Ministry of Education, and the federal institutes. Uh, giving their technical expertise and also yes that's it because these are the the institutions involved from the brazilian side thank you alice um okay. now we will have a five minute break and we'll be back with um with uh marta uh really soon thank you Can, we can help them uh, to give, yeah. Uh, so we can not only give them uh, help uh, by giving them visibility, we also wanted to give them the opportunity to work with experts in the real implementation of their ideas. So this is what this project was about, recognizing some of the best ideas coming from students in the SDSN network and connecting them to the practical field. Um, so now let's see how this uh, partnership uh, took place. So first of all, it was possible, I would say, because both organizations had a common goal. Um, so that common goal, as I said, was uh, SDG 13. And of course, um, SDSN has different objectives, uh, but uh, very different objectives than uh, Siemens Gamesa, which was the, the company I'm going to tell you about, uh, but we were both trying to solve the same underlying challenges. So the, the, the project was born on this basis. First, that addressing uh, the climate emergency by changing the trajectory of uh, CO2 levels is the most pressing imperative of our time, and it requires both solutions. Second, that many uh, students are particularly uh, worried about this, and from SDSN, we can give them the chance to be part of this solution. Uh, so uh, 
how, how do we know about these solutions? How can we connect them with those who could make them possible? So this was our worry, our, our objective from SDSN. On the other hand, uh, the company with who we worked on this project, Siemens Camesa, is a global leader in renewable energy. Uh, and they have been promoting STEM studies for a long time, and they wanted to identify uh, talent worldwide in this area. So, so first of all, they approached us through SDSN News. Uh, we started with some collaborations in hackathons and other events. Uh, but all this uh, knowing each other for a while led to, to a, a more broader initiative, which is what I'm going to, to share. Next slide, please. Um, so some uh, context about how this collaboration can happen between a network, an academic network like SDSN and a big uh, uh, international company like uh, Siemens Camesa. So as I said, this has started like a soft collaboration on a national level. Uh, as I said, press contacts uh, were to participate in events in Spain and then it went global. Why? I would say because of the characteristics of the partners, uh, which I show in the, in the square on, on the left, uh, you know, Siemens Gamesa is a company that is dedicated to renewable energies, and it is a company that has wide commitment to sustainability. So this was like the perfect context to, to work with them. Second, SDSN is a nonprofit with quite agile operations and decision-making process. So we have the flexibility uh, to align the project and the timelines to the company's needs for, for short-term outcomes, like normally companies have. And we also had the understanding, uh, the need to align the project with the company's strategy. So this will be the characteristics of the two partners. And the second aspect was the added value of the proposal for, for both organizations. So for SDSN, Siemens Gamesa had two main assets, I would say. Uh, the connections with uh, with the global leader in clean energies and with all their experts worldwide, and second, of course, the ability to to provide funding. And secondly, for the company, SDSN could provide access to university students, uh, in particular in some of their priority countries. So we could reach, you know, like everywhere. Uh, second, the core generation of innovative solutions together with our network and their experts. And finally, the co-branding with the UN initiative. So this is a bit of the context. Uh, what was the collaboration that came out of all these discussions? Next slide, please. This is what came out. Uh, the, the competition called the Universities for Goal 13, uh, a Siemens Gamesa Award to Climate Solutions. So we both joined forces to recognize the most uh, disruptive and transformative solutions emerging from, from our networks. Uh, as uh, you can read here, this is uh, an annual competition for undergraduate and graduate students of, of, all, the no of the, all the global network. Uh, the project takes uh, place simultaneously in five countries and, and showcase how universities can contribute from their regions. Secondly, it aims to promote university talent in the fight against climate change by identifying these solutions. Um, the, the students work across uh, disciplines, um, different disciplines to produce those solutions for energy transition and environmental sustainability. Uh, there are some requirements uh, for this solution. So we established that they have to be, they have to have a disruptive potential. They have to be aligned with the SDGs and they had to be technically feasible. Uh, third, uh, this competition wants to foster interdisciplinary work and team cooperation. Uh, so the students were responsible for choosing the problem they wanted to solve, and they decided with uh, their tutors within the university how the teams would be composed. So they were very varied uh, with students from uh, many uh, different faculties, uh, disciplines, um, from humanities to STEM studies, et cetera. And uh, finally, uh, the competition, uh, as I said before, wants to, uh, to help further the development and make it possible with mentorship and funding. So the, the students work for several months, assisted by teaching staff and experts from, from the company. Uh, and uh, then they get, uh, the, there is a winner that uh, is awarded 
ten thousand uh, dollars. And also there is a, a public event in which we present uh, the project and it's presented to a global audience. So um, yeah, this uh, this is a bit of uh, uh, the outlines of the project. So uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, let's just uh, jump on this one, please. Juliana, thank you. Um, so up, some outcomes from the first edition, I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, for this first uh, edition, we selected five SDSM members uh, from China, South Africa, Germany, USA, and Brazil. Uh, as I said, Puc Rio was one of the of the institutions, and pre precisely because this university aims to become a hub of, uh, for the energy transition in Brazil, like the Vice Rector Marcelo Gattaz mentioned uh, during his presentation. Uh, the participation was very high. A total of 14 teams sent proposals with more than 50 students uh, being involved. And only in China, the competition attracted in the first round of, of the selection 25 teams with more than 100 students uh, participating in, in the first round of selection. Um, then with the company, with Siemens Gamesa, we, we managed to mobilize more than 10 mentors worldwide, range, ranging from uh, renewable energies experts to country managers and top executives in, in the company. And finally, as you can see in the picture, uh, the award ceremony uh, took place last September with the participation of uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, with the vice president of networks, Maria Cortes Puig, and also with the top executive from uh, from Siemens Gamesa. And this event um, was held alongside the International Conference for Sustainable Development, the SDSN organizes annually. And it had uh, about 150 participants, being also one of the most successful um, events in, in the conference. Um, in the first cohort of teams, uh, I just have to say we had amazing solutions addressing issues such as the use of biofuel, biofuels, uh, sustainable land use, sustainable wind turbines, or even new ways of generating uh, sustainable energy. So as an example, uh, the team from Puc Rio developed a, a tool uh, to support the licensing of offshore wind farms. Uh, and this is a project that caught the attention of the Siemens engineers who have extended even their mentorship to the team for a longer period. Um, I would say that anyone interested in knowing more about uh, this project developed by Brazil or, or about the competition in general, uh, you may contact the manager of SDSM Brazil, uh, Melissa Antunes. So maybe Melissa, if you want to remind your, your contact uh, or they want to reach me, I'm also happy to to give you more information about this competition. So next slide, please. So all the, the five uh, final solutions were presented, all of them in, in the format of pitch videos. Uh, some of them are available online. Uh, you may check uh, the example here from the, the students of the University of, of Pretoria. I will I will share the link after, after I finish my, I conclude my presentation. So you can have a look. Uh, this, uh, this project was also wonderful. We designed a solar power non-thermal plasma technology uh, to treat water in their rural communities. Uh, this project has already um, obtained uh, further funding to be implemented in some communities. So it's great to see how, how these projects are not only on, on paper, but they also uh, get done. So I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sharing with you um, why I see an opportunity uh, for Puc Rio again uh, to participate again if they want in, in the second edition. Um, and I, I would really like to encourage all the professors and staff uh, from, from the university who want to get involved uh, to reach to us. So as I mentioned, <coughs> Um, I can just say that the mentors that participated in, in this initiative found it not only enriching, but extremely rewarding. So I really recommend uh, you, you join us. Um, why? You get to mobilize students across the university. Uh, you get to engage them in, in such a global challenge like climate change. Uh, you get them uh, the chance to develop a project and, and get some initial funding. 
uh, for a specific solution. Uh, you get the students to get mentorship from one of the top companies in renewable energies. Uh, not only the mentorship uh, period is, is amazing, but also the fact that uh, this may give them also work opportunities for the future. And, and finally, uh, with this project, uh, an SDSM member was part of a, a global initiative. So uh, I hope you will be uh, joining us in this exciting project for the next edition. And uh, thank you for your time for listening to this project. Uh, I'm, I'm now uh, happy to answer any questions. Back to you, Isabella. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. It's really, really exciting to hear about this project. Thank you for telling us about it. Uh, we have one question for you, uh, and it's how do you think this partnership can inspire private entities from other sectors that are not from the energy sector to want to engage with the work of SDSN? Yes, um, I mean, this um, uh, this experience was extraordinary because, as I said, the context was like a perfect match uh, because the sponsor is totally aligned with the work we're doing. Uh, but in general, I would say that um, I think uh, companies also find very rewarding working with uh, with students, you know, uh, getting this uh, young energy to, to develop new ideas. Um, so this worked very well. And also I would say that um, our network can be uh, very uh, very flexible in working with companies uh, and um, in this sense I have to say uh, that it was very easy to work with this company as well because the team of the social commitment department was totally aligned with the way we work we had the same vision so I think the um, the key here is to find uh, a company in which you find yourself comfortable with a team with who you share uh, the vision and, and the mission um and finally uh you know uh the results are just so amazing two of the projects are going to be implemented so you get real results and uh both the company and sdsn uh benefit from this so it's uh like in marketing they say like a win-win uh, situation thank you very much marta um i would like now to invite uh dr monica uh, sorry, Dr. Oscar Molina Perrina, Chair of SDSN Bolivia, to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, if I can uh, share my, my screen. One moment, please. Can you see my screen? Uh, we can. We can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, for me and SDSM Bolivia. It's a great pleasure to to participate in these conferences in Brazil uh, to share with you the most important insights of our work in SDSM Bolivia. And with the most detail, the, the municipal atlas of the SDGs. First, I, I would like to show you some information about my country. Of course, in Brazil, you know, uh, Bolivia is a small economy. In uh, nominal terms, the, the GDP is, is $40 billion. Brazil is more than 1,600 billion. It is interesting the, that uh, when I talk about Bolivia in, in other countries, uh, many people from Europe, uh, Africa, Asia, or including some people from the United States think that Bolivia uh, has a very small territory, but this is not true. And of course, you know, we have more than 1 million of, uh, of square kilometers. This is uh, more than France and Spain together. In terms of uh, population, we are a small country, only 12 million people. Or a GDP per capita in parity purchasing power is, is $9,000, uh, half of the global average. Uh, Brazil, for example, for the same year is $16,000. And in 2000, you know, the GDP per capita 
in PPP in Bolivia was $3,000 and the global average was more than $8,000. In, in these two decades, uh, we advanced in many economic and social issues, uh, but of course, as in many other countries, we have a lot of work to do in these next uh, few years. Uh, and another information, the percentage of the population living below the national poverty line in, in PPP is 70%. Inflation, inflation is interesting uh, because at this moment it is the one of the lowest in the world. Um, the main reason for this uh, low inflation in Bolivia are the control prices, the subsidies to gasoline, gas, and diesel, uh, the fixed exchange rate in Bolivia, and of course the, the smuggling. With the lock of frontiers with Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Chile, and Paraguay, and the devaluation of the currencies in these countries, it is easy to move cheaper goods into Bolivia. And external debt stocks, 43% of the gross national income, total reserves about $4 billion that represent five months of importation. Deforestation, more than 500,000 uh, hectares. It is a critical issue in Bolivia. And uh, tourism, the most rapidly growing sector before the pandemic, and a little bit of publicity for my country, Bolivia is one of the naturally most beautiful countries in the world. Which uh, is our priority now in SDSM Bolivia? Uh, our main priority is, is, is provide information to improve decision making. How? We want to prepare the new version of the Atlas. Our idea was present the, the new version in uh, 2023. However, the, the census was postponed up to the 2024 by political and technical issues. And the data of the census is the most important to calculate the indicators of the SDGs. We expect to have uh, the new version of the Atlas by 2025. At this moment in, Bol in Bolivia, we are living a difficult situation because Santa Cruz, the largest city in Bolivia and the most important uh, in economic uh, terms, is in a break, uh, claiming a new census in 2023. Why? The census is, is, is important in Bolivia. The, the new census will, will determine the, the new number of the chairs of the chambers of those senators and deputies, and the most importantly, the further distribution of the fiscal resources. Meanwhile, uh, in, in SDSM Bolivia, we are receiving uh, proposals from researchers for new indicators to be included in the next version to fill some gaps in the first version. We also want to provide information for the more than uh, 250 indigenous territories. At this moment, this data doesn't exist in, in Bolivia. In other projects, also we are working in the project Orbita. This project Orbita is the first observatory of the sustainable tourism in Bolivia. We are working in Global Living Wage Coalition. Uh, that, that project providing uh, updating uh, estimate of living wage across the world. And we are working on the project inequalities related to the social mobility and inequality in Bolivia. Let me show you uh, more about this, this municipal atlas of the SDGs in Bolivia. This, this atlas uh, provides a detailed diagnostics related to the performance of every single municipality in Bolivia in the many different dimensions of the sustainable development. No? In a multicultural country, one of the most critical troubles is, of course, the inequality in many dimensions. If the country doesn't know the current situation, they neither knows the solutions. In this analogy, it is similar to the disease in the medicine. We need to know everything about the disease to implement correctly the treatment. With more than 300 municipalities in Bolivia, of course, the situation is very different in each municipality. Please, please uh, visit our webpage to, to to know more with more detail about uh, the atlas in, in Bolivia. Which is the most uh, crucial, important innovation in, at this document, uh, the cartograms. Regular maps and the indicators often do not give a good overview of the size of the challenges. The atlas include cartograms. In these cartograms, 
the, the area reflects the population size and do not the geographical size. For example, on the left, on the left, you can see the map of Bolivia of all to all the municipalities. The little green, this this little green, uh, this little green municipality uh, is is La Paz, where I live. Uh, in three cities, La Paz, Cochabamba, and Santa Cruz, the eje central in Bolivia, here, 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 live more than seventy five percent of the population. On the right, you can see a cartogram of the same indicator in terms of the population size. It's very, very interesting. These cartograms give us an accurate dimension of the indicator. Another example in the Northeast is Beni. Beni, for example, here. Beni is next to Brazil. Beni is one of the nine departments in Bolivia. And Beni is similar to Ecuador in size but only leaves 400,000 people. In the Atlas, you can find a cartogram for all dimension of the SDGs in Bolivia. Which are the impacts in terms of citation when academic terms? Uh, in Google Scholar, only we, have, only we have 12 situation. We are a little sad about it, but we are making academic seminars to present the Atlas to many universities and members of the network. Our impact is, is better in the global SDG reports with a 24-hour citation. However, we are uh, very sure that the many politicians read the Atlas to make a decision. Uh, this is uh, a good news for us uh, at this moment on the situation in Bolivia in, in this 2022. <clears throat> in terms of decision making, uh, we know the Atlas is used to, to get to guide investment decision of the local and international institution. Many NGOs use our, our data because it's the only available. This is the go uh, okay. Um, based on the result of the Atlas in 2022, SDSM Bolivia uh, decide to focus on tourism. At this moment, at this moment with uh, financing from IDRC from Canada, we launched the Bolivian Observatory, Observatory of Sustainable Tourism, Orbita. We are very sure that uh, tourism is the future of development in Bolivia. SDSN Spain will send an expert on tourism to Bolivia for our solutions forum event in November. If you can come to Bolivia, please come. Uh, this is a great event in, 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 on November. Uh, as I said before, Bolivia is a multicultural country when uh, 37 official languages, one of the following year's challenges is providing information for the more than 250 indigenous territories. The task we, we, we know is complex, but we are pretty sure, pretty sure we can do it the next year. For the need of information, uh, for other many reasons, the, the next version of the Atlas will include a special section for this beauty, beautiful characteristic in my country. And we are sure that it will help to empower indigenous people and also to move forward together as one country to reach the SDGs in 2030. Finally, I would like to show you some pictures of my country, Bolivia. If you don't know Bolivia yet, uh, please visit us. You can see the salt flats, Salario Uni, La Paz, one of the new seven wonder cities, La Chiquitania, Santa Cruz, the largest city in, in Bolivia, La Paz, Cochabamba. Bolivia is a, a beautiful country. And of course, we, we need help. We need to improve many, many things but uh, we are working together to reach this, this, um, these goals uh, to 2030. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for, this, for this time. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Oscar. Uh, it's really, really interesting to hear about the Municipal Atlas of the SDGs in Bolivia. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, we have uh, one question. Um, just one second. 
the question is, uh, how do you envision Orbita being a case study model or model for other networks to replicate and thus uh, possibly creating a pan-regional initiative around sustainable tourism? Uh, sorry. Yes, about sustainable tourism, tourism and culture to contribute to the region's post-pandemic recovery. At, at this moment, the, the tourist the Orbita project is in the, the first steps. Uh, we only uh, have uh, some projects, many information. Uh, we expect that the, the, this forum on November give us uh, many, many information and the possibility to, to share with another networks uh, or, or projects and results. But the most important thing at this moment in Bolivia is the, the tourism, the tourism, this uh, this that this industry without emissions, we think it's the most important uh, sector in Bolivia. We know that in Bolivia have many, many natural resources. We have uh, many, many diversity uh, zones, and we expect to increase the mobility of, 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 of tourists uh, to, to Bolivia in the next years and change and change this, uh, this um, uh, uh, dependency to the to the natural resources and change the the growth in Bolivia about the tourism. <clears throat> Thank you, Oscar. Uh, I would like now to invite to the floor uh, Dr. Uh, Monica Pinida, Assistant Director of the SDG Center for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes, your sound is great. Perfect. So thank you uh, everyone for, for the invitation and for inviting us to present the Center of Sustainable Development Goals for Latin America and the Caribbean. So my name is Monica Pinilla and I'm here representing the center and all the research team. So first of all, like we just want to talk about what is the SDG Center, uh, who is which is based in Universidad de los Andes uh, in Bogota, Colombia. So we are one of the five uh, research centers at the university. There are different research centers at the university that are working in uh, agriculture, uh, agro food services, in develop of the children, in guaranteeing uh, sustainable finances, and as as the Center of Sustainable Development Goals. We are part of the SDG uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and we are one of the five uh, excellent uh, centers who are located in the different regions of the world. And our general objective is to create knowledge or to generate knowledge that supports the implementation of uh, the SDG agenda in the region, in the whole Latin America and the Caribbean, and to work with different academic institutions and governments, organizations, the private sector, and the civil society in order that we can guarantee that the SDG agenda is uh, achieved in the whole uh, region. So we also have different or specific uh, objectives. One is to consolidate a network or a network of, re uh, of researchers that are working on, rela on topics related to the sustainable development agenda. We are trying to move not only to think about the SDGs, but also we are trying to think about sustainability in the whole concept and trying to analyze how the different dimensions of sustainability play a role in the achievement of the SDGs. In this case, what we are trying to analyze in here and what we are trying to create a network on is on researchers that are working on the analysis of economic and environmental actions or the analysis of how the environmental actions improve or not the uh, socioeconomic conditions of the populations in the region. So we also want to become a platform to disseminate knowledge. So part of the mission of the center is to create knowledge, but also to talk to different policymakers and try to discuss how this knowledge can um, help policymaking and can uh, really provide opportunities to analyze and to implement policies to achieve the SDG agenda. Another uh, objective that we have in the center is uh, to evaluate policies and programs to achieve the SDGs. And finally, we want to participate in the global discussion of the achievement of the 2030 agenda for Latin America and the Caribbean and to show how the region has moved in the right or not, uh, move in the right direction. <laughs> Sorry. 
So we have focus on three main areas. So at the beginning of the center, we are we were focused mainly in the climate climate action, but now we are also trying to include these other dimensions of sustainability, and including the dimension of well-being, focusing in the SDG number one, SDG uh, number three on health, and an SDG number ten in inequalities. And also we have a, a focus in the agrofood systems and how the interaction between the different production of food and the different uh, uh, reduction of the hunger is um, related to the different indicators, especially those related with climate. How we say this, so we, as, as I mentioned in the specific objective, we have three main areas. We generate knowledge, we have a, a, a part of impact, like trying to do a lot of incidents in color, uh, with the governments. And also we try to participate in a lot of the platforms in order that we can have a conversation about how this knowledge really can create an impact on the policy make. So we as a center have different strategic products and we are trying to work on how we can implement more products and can create more of these um, research. So the first and one of the most important products of the center is the SDG index for, America, for Latin America and the Caribbean. This SDG index was launched in 2021. In the, uh, it was launched in July of 2022 and includes information for the region, for the uh, most of the, of the countries in the region and measure the progress of the region as a whole and for the different countries in the achievement of the SDG agenda. It uses the um, SDSN methodology to, to measure the achievement of the SDGs in the different regions. We also have different SDG uh, documents that are, or are aiming or the main objective is to try to have this conversation with policymakers and try to improve the evidence and, and, and try to provide a lot of evidence on how we are achieving the SDG agenda. Currently, we are launching the last one that it was, um, or it provides information on how the carbonization measures have been implemented in Latin America and in Colombia. So all, our, all of you are invited to, to go to the SDG Center uh, webpage and download the document. And also we have, um, we conducted a, a regional survey on sustainable consumption and the data is available for everyone who wants to analyze it. It's a, it has been anonymized and have information about uh, how, what are the consumption, uh, for, um, products of how people are they are using or implementing in their own lives the sustainable consumption patterns in seven different countries and these uh, include aspects related with perceptions but also with attitudes about consumption and how we are really implemented these uh, type of uh, aspects in our daily lives and this data is available on request and you can conduct your analysis and the write papers or, or notes on this. Uh, one, another thing that is really important for us is to uh, promote research. And in 2018, we have, uh, in 2019, we, we made a call of applications for different grants, and we uh, award the grant to six different research projects, two in uh, working on SDG number 11, another two in SDG 13, and another two that analyze the interaction between SDG 2 and SDG 15. Uh, and these uh, projects are closed now and the publications will be available on the web page of the center. And if this project was at the interaction or aim to really understand what is happening in the region. And one of the things that is uh, important in these projects and we need to highlight it is that these research projects are the contribution or are the collaboration of different universities in the region working together in order to understand better how we are reaching or uh, achieving this different SDGs that were uh, the focus in here. And one thing that also we, we have, and the center has been refocused on this, is to create different platforms or different courses in order to incentivize the knowledge and increase the knowledge of uh, the SDG agenda. So we have three massive open online courses in Coursera. They are free of charge if you want to go and take them. There is one for sustainable development goals, like just the general concepts. There is another one that is sustainable development goals for uh, entrepreneurship or for companies. 
And the final one is sustainable development goals, but with a view for the schools. And in these three courses, what we aim is to provide information, based, like what is the basic information that a person needs to know about the SDGs, but also how you can implement that knowledge in, your, in the companies and how also how you can transmit that knowledge to students, especially in the schools. From the center, we, are, we believe that it's important that not that we, the team or from the center, we believe that the achievement of the SDG agenda is not only for the states, it includes different stakeholders and us as individuals are one main stakeholder and one actor that needs to really start creating changes and working with the students, working with children, with the adolescents in order that they also understand what is the SDG agenda and how they can contribute is really important for us. And we have been continue uh, working in the continued education uh, portfolio, and we have been working with Universidad de los Andes in order that we can produce different uh, courses and um, subjects uh, for students in undergrad and postgrad learning about what is sustainable development and how they can contribute on this, or also how the sustainable development concept interacts with other concepts in development. And one thing that we have uh, also, and we are really keen as well, is like how we can incentivate the interaction with different policy uh, makers and how can we move the SDG agenda in the policy arena. So in here, what we have been working and participating, especially in Colombia, that is where we are based, we have been discussing with the different uh, stakeholders, with different ministries, the national development, uh, Center in order that the SDG agenda can be part of the plan, uh, the national development plan, and also that people continue learning about the SDGs and listen to universities and listen to the researchers about how the SDG agenda is to, it's been, uh, been achieved or not, and how the different policies can align themselves with the SDG agenda in order that we can guarantee that first no one is left behind, but also that there are a lot of policies trying to analyze and understand these different SDGs and how the 70 SDGs interact with each other. And one thing that is really important in here and that I want to mention is that we as, um, as a center, we are part of the multi-stakeholder platform for the fulfillment of the SDG agenda in, in Colombia. And we are trying to really promote how the SDG it can or should be like some uh, or the goals of the SDG should be transversal or should be included in all the analysis that the policymakers are doing. So just to summarize in here, what we are trying to do is to have a lot of impact in policymaker, but also to create research that support that impact. For us as a center, it's really important that it's not only about talking about the SDGs, but also talking about SDGs with data and SDGs with evidence in order that we can inform policymakers and can help communities, uh, private sector, uh, schools, uh, students to really understand what is their role in the achievement of the SDG agenda and also how they can really incorporate actions in order that uh, they can provide information and evidence on the, um, the achievement of the SDGs. We are working with different universities around Latin America, and we are really happy to be here and know that there are other universities also doing uh, really um, uh, amazing things on, on this. And one thing that is really important is that we as a center also are trying to work with the private sector. The private sector sometimes approach us and tell us like, okay, I want to really analyze what I'm doing and, and I want to analyze how my policies are aligned with the SDG agenda. How can I contribute to uh, the achievement of the different SDGs or how at least can contribute to, uh, or, or how can I at least align everything that I'm doing in order that is sustainable and really have that, that mark of uh, the SDGs. So we are also working with them in order that we can provide some information and some guidance on how to align the different objectives, how to provide um, and how to measure their impact on the SDG agenda and how really uh, they want to understand this. So I think I'm finished here. <laughs> Thank you very much. If anyone has any question, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for presenting all of the 
product products developed with, uh, by you and the, all of your education strategies, stakeholder engagement, it seems <laughs> like a, a lot of activities happening. Um, we have uh, three questions uh, and we have a little bit of time. So uh, I will go ahead with the three of them. First one is, can you please comment on the center's work with Universidade Estadual de Campinas in Brazil and how we can work with other Brazilian institutions? The second question was if Brazil is one of the seven countries that you mentioned. And the third one is if you have uh, any course, a MOOC uh, focus on state bodies. So thank you very much. Uh, we have been working with Universidad de Campinas, but we don't have, uh, we have been uh, like a little bit wired the pan uh, because of the pandemic, we couldn't continue the activities that we were doing uh, with different universities, especially in Brazil, but we have been in contact in the last months and we are really happy and we would like to continue working and finding which um, possibilities or which uh, points we can uh, have in common in order that uh, we, we continue uh, the, the collaboration that it was at the beginning of the center. So uh, I'm going to write my email in the in the chat. So please, please feel free um, to contact me if you have any questions and if you want to be in contact with the center and see what collaborations we can do. Uh, I think Brazil was not included in the survey because we, it was only included for countries that speak Spanish. Uh, but um, the data is available in there, and I imagine I, I feel that some of the all the results can be transferable. It's not the same, and completely uh, aware of that. But it's there, and it can be used if if it's good for the, for you. And what was the final question? Sorry, Isabella. Um, the final question was if you have any course focused on state bodies. Okay. No, uh, in this moment, we don't have any course that are uh, related with the um, stakeholder, like policy uh, makers. Uh, we only have for the general one, uh, for students and for the private sector. What we are trying to do, but this is more like continuous education, like these diploma courses, we're trying to develop like a micro and micro credential in, a, in sustainable development, but these are not focused on a government or a stakeholders. I think uh, in here in Colombia, we have a lot of um, work on that from the National Development uh, Pro Program, like the institution that is, uh, or the Minister of Development, let's say like that. So we, we haven't focused on that, but that can be a good option. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Monica. Um, we have one more question, if that's okay with you. Uh, the question is, uh, could you please comment a little bit about the work the Center for Latin America and the Caribbean has done to implement SDG3 in the area? So we as a center, what we are doing, we haven't done anything, let's, let me think. Um, Specifically in SDG number three, we have a focus or so that like currently what we are doing is to try to analyze first the data on SDG number three for the region, how we have achieved uh, SDG or not uh, in, the, in the different region. In the report of the uh, SDGs for Latin America, we focus on SDG number three and we were like analyzing how the pandemic for uh, the COVID-19 pandemic Produce the achievement of the SDG number three and the different goals. And what we are doing is to try to focus a little bit more the research that we are doing as a center in SDG number three. So we are working with the School of Medicine at the Universidad de los Andes. We are trying to increase the number of data or the amount of data that we have disaggregated by SDG number three. We are also collaborating in here inside in, in Colombia doing different analysis on the achievement of the SDG number three, especially for big cities. So we participate in the, uh, there is a report uh, for Bogota Como Vamos, that is like to analyze how the city is moving forward in the achievement of different SDGs. And we as a center uh, work with the School of Medicine analyzing the data for SDG number three. So we are also like really open to have research uh, on that. and. 
we are part, um, we have been working in, in different policy briefs uh, with the Lancet Commission on the impact of climate change on health in order to analyze how the different uh, indicators that have been included by the Lancet Commission that are related with green uh, spaces, with the access to um, with, with the uh, mosquito or dengue uh, prevalence, how those um, policies have been implemented in the region and especially in, a, in, in the tropical countries and how this has been affected the achievement of the SDG number three. So those are the areas that we are working and conducting research uh, in order to, to contribute in the analysis of the SDG number three. Thank you very much, um, Monica. We will now uh, proceed with Sonia Neves. Sonia Neves, sorry. Um, Sonia will talk about uh, SDSN USA, a network for advancing the SDGs through collaboration in the United States. Sorry, I'm dodging some afternoon light here in uh, <laughs> New York City. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. Okay, great. I think this seems to be working. Uh, let's start at the very beginning though. So I'm Sonia Navy. Uh, I am uh, the program and outreach coordinator for SDSN USA, which is the SDSN network uh, in the United States. We are a network for advancing the SDGs through collaboration. Um, a little bit of background on our network. We build pathways for sustainable development in the U.S. by mobilizing research, outreach, collective action, and global cooperation. And we have been around since December 2018, but growing ever since then, we're now over 180 members, uh, kind of across the country in 46 states, as well as D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And 73% of our members our universities or university departments or centers, uh, meaning that three fourths of our members are, are universities and, and one fourth are think tanks, networks, uh, NGOs, et cetera. Uh, in order to fulfill our mission, we facilitate and lead coalitions uh, to address sustainability in the US. We um, build sophisticated practical systems for assessing progress. That's our uh, our data, our flagship reports, the US state and cities SDG indices, as well as reporting on racial and economic disparity in the US and some other kind of thematic reporting. We three facilitate public awareness, education and engagement among our membership and as well as the public in the US. And we link these efforts with policymakers and community leaders throughout the US US to, rel uh, to result in lasting change. Um, just a little background on how the US is doing on the SDGs. We ranked 32 out of 193 on the 2020 Sustainable Development Index released by SDSN, and we ranked 16 in the World Happiness Index. Uh, also released by SDSN, we could be doing better. We're the only OECD country and one of five countries total that have not completed a voluntary national review. Um, and there is significant variation across states and cities in the U.S. on acknowledgement and progress on the SDGs. Um, this map here is from the 2021 U.S. Sustainable Development Report. Um, as you can see, all states have work to do here. There's no green on this map, uh, green meaning SDGG achievement. Uh, so no states are Sonia? coming. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, is it possible for you to make a slideshow mode? Because we are seeing the next slide and... Oh no. We're seeing your notes. <laughs> is this correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I did not know. Um, and then here you can see that, wait, let me. Is this correct? Isabel? Yes. yes. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so as you can see here, we are falling behind on the SDGs. Uh, we have some yellow and some orange, meaning challenges remain and major challenges remain, um, but no green. And then here is uh, our, our uh, racial inequality index. So this is mapping uh, SDG delivery to the least served racial communities in the US. Um, we call it's from the in the red report and we call it that because as you can see most of the US is in the red. Um, uh, the least served racial communities are served uh, three times less than white communities in the US or the most served racial communities. And uh, no states, even the highest performing states, which you can see on this map are Oregon, Idaho, Hawaii, none of them are even more than 50% uh, on the way to SDG achievement based on race. And then here you can see a little bit about how we are uh, tracking the SDGs. We go from the SDG to the target to the indicator level. Uh, so SDG 5 is to achieve gender equality. Uh, and empower all women and girls. And so in our uh, sustainable development reports, we use indicators to track that progress. So for one indicator for SDG 5 is the gender wage gap. Uh, and as you can see in both of these charts, the uh, cities and states in the US are falling far behind other OECD countries. Uh, for the worst locations in the US, it's really drastic, a higher wage, gender wage gap obviously uh, being worse and, and the uh, worst performing US cities performing quite high. And then on the right, even in our best locations, not reaching the levels of other OECD countries. Uh, and these are our indices. We use the global index released by SDSN um, to compare ourselves against other countries. And then we do reporting at the state and city level, uh, as well as the county level and, and local level. Um, on the left is our regular, our uh, annual flagship uh, state index, the U.S. Sustainable Development Report released in 2021. Uh, near the bottom is our U.S. Cities Index. The last one was released in 2019, um, but with one coming on the way next year in early 2023. Um, and then some of our other reports on the right two uh, reports disaggregated by race, one on the left, the uh, Zero Carbon Action Plan, which is currently a national plan, but we are working to uh, regionalize it, to bring it to cities and regions, um, to help them provide them a, a policy framework for decarbonization. And as I mentioned before, we are working to link these efforts uh, with policymakers and community leaders throughout the U.S., and we have several examples of that. Uh, on the left is the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, our Zero Hunger Pathways Project, which is a working group uh, that our members are involved in. They ran a series of dialogues over the last year, uh, culminating in recommendations that were submitted to the White House Conference on Hunger, Health and Nutrition. Um, and actually at that conference, President Joe Biden did make a commitment to zero hunger by 2030. So it was really great for our members to have contributed to that. Um, in the center is one of our efforts to uh, localize the zero carbon action plan that I mentioned in the previous slide. We contributed to, SDSN contributed to the San Diego Regional Decarbonization Framework, um, bringing the uh, recommendations from our zero carbon action plan to a county level. And we're hoping that through the lessons that we learned from that experience to bring a, uh, create a guide um, that can help other cities and counties do the same thing. Um, and then Sustain SC, Sustain South Carolina is a really great example of one of our partners using our reports uh, to help advance their, their work at the local level. Sustain SC kind of brings together businesses um, and local stakeholders to invest in sustain sustainability in South Carolina. And they used our sustainable development report that shows where South Carolina compa compares to other states in the US, as well as where it's doing well and where it lags behind on the SDGs. And bringing it to their local level, they were able to uh, identify places that they needed to do, be doing more work and also to uh, kind of use it as an incentive or to get a little competitive with other states. Um, to show that they could be doing better than other states in their region that are, were higher achieving on the SDGs. 
Uh, here's just a quick list of SDSN USA's current initiatives, uh, ranging from Z the Z our Zero Carbon Consortium doing work on uh, climate action, our Diversity, Equity, and Justice Working Group, our Zero Hunger Working Group that I mentioned has run a series of dialogues and is working on uh, some policy recommendations, tracking progress on the SDGs through our indices, SDG in Paris Climate Localization, SDSN Youth USA, Mission 4.7 Education for All, which is a recent working group uh, that is meeting regularly to create a community of practice for our members and then plans to host a conference next year on transforming education. There's lots of ways that members engage with SDSN USA. We have monthly networking meetings. Those look like informal coffee chats where uh, members are really just uh, able to network with one another and we receive updates on all of their initiatives. Uh, our annual networking me network meeting, all members are invited to, uh, webinars and project launches, thematic dialogues and seminars, uh, working group convenings um, and other events. And then these are different ways that our members are engaging on the SDGs at their own institutions. Um, so they are reorienting programs of learning, engaging student leadership and scholarship, establishing research centers, grants, et cetera, for cross-sectoral programs. They're integrating priorities across administrative offices. We see especially at uh, facilities management, sustainability offices, planning uh, levels. Um, they also organize local community uh, conversations on the SDGs. We really uh, try to uh, emphasize and amplify those uh, community university partnerships that are happening in our network. They're publicly reporting and engaging on the goals, and I will talk a little bit more about that in a moment, and then proactively addressing injustice and equities, as well as actively engaging with uh, our initiatives and our network. So I just want to give a couple of partner and member spotlights um, so you can hear a little bit more about the great work being done by our members. The first is the Hawaii Green Growth Local 2030 Hub. Uh, it was it, they conducted the Aloha Bench Plus Benchmark Report, which is a voluntary local review for Hawaii, uh, one of the first in our country. The first one was established in 2020, and I know that they have updated it since. Um, and this was just a way to a comprehensive look at how Hawaii is doing across the SDGs, uh, and they decided their indicators by uh, convening stakeholders and 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 you know, agreeing upon those indicators. And then they also have the Aloha Plus Goals Scorecard, uh, which is also keeping, uh, it's a data dashboard that's hosted on the Hawaii government's website um, that also kind of shows where they're on track on certain uh, indicators and where they need improvement. Um, and it's available for the public to, to use and it has a lot of buy-in from public, private and government uh, stakeholders. Another member spotlight that I wanted to uh, show is the voluntary university reviews. Uh, two have been conducted so far to my knowledge. The first being the first ever in, in the world, the uh, Carnegie Mellon University Voluntary University Review. The first was done in 2020 uh, with UC Davis conducting a voluntary university review soon after in 2021 um, and, and Carnegie Mellon also updating theirs in 2021. And it's also a comprehensive look uh, at the SDGs across different departments, across uh, research, education, and uh, university activities um, that really helps the university see how they're uh, working on the SDGs, what different work is being done, uh, helping break down silos at the university campus, um, and then again to identify places that can be improved. And finally, the Solve Climate by 2030 program out of Bard College uh, deserves a spotlight because they are doing their local they're doing local and global work on uh, climate. They hosted a worldwide climate teach-in first in 2020 and ha have now done one each year with one coming up in March of 2023. Um, and this was this is a really interesting program. They uh, have over a thousand universities 
colleges, K through 12 institutions, high schools uh, involved in a single day of uh, climate teaching, uh, but each hosting their own in their own communities. This map shows how global their reach is. They have schools from all over the world involved, um, bringing in experts, university professors, uh, advocates, students to uh, kind of bring a local context to the to climate, but um, also convening on the same day to show how uh, this is both a global, national, and local issue. Yeah, and that's just a, a snapshot at some what some of our members are doing. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, and I'm willing to take any questions. Thank you, Sonia. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, so there is uh, one question. Um, so Brazil, Brazil's energy is uh, mostly renewable coming from hydroelectrics, but many times they're associated with social problems, uh, people being removed from the territories, uh, et cetera. So uh, the reality is uh, different from the United States, but it's still, uh, there is a need to invest in, in this transition to a more sustainable uh, energy. So do you see um, any, uh, is SDSN, do you know if they're working with uh, the energy transition in Brazil to do a, a work similar to the one that you did for the United States? That sounds really interesting. I, I don't know what connections have been made so far, but the regional decarbonization framework that I spoke about should be uh, able to be applied to uh, regional context across the world. It's it's taking the, the information that we have from creating one for San Diego County and, and the challenges and, and bringing together what stakeholders there are at kind of at that county level. Counties, of course, include, include multiple cities, uh, mo multiple local governments. Um, and so just taking into consideration all of that uh, we're hoping that it can be applied elsewhere. So I'm sure that it could be shared with the Brazil context as soon as uh, it's available. Um, I know that we're bringing it currently to uh, cities in the US, but I do see this as something that could be applied worldwide, yeah. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, and now uh, we, uh, we are coming to to the end of our session. So I'd like to uh, give the floor to Dr. Tasio Mauro de Campos, Chair of SDSN Brazil for closing remarks. Okay, are you hearing me? We can, but yeah. we cannot see you. Well, let me see if I can, uh, so that start it. Okay. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. To all participants of this third uh, STSM Brazil conference. Um, Dr. Taz, one second. Uh, I can hear uh, something like your sound. We can hear you, but it's vibrating a little bit. Let me see if I can. Is, the, is, that, is it okay or now? Oh, yes. Way better. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Well, I'll close the... Uh, Dr. Tassos, yes, we, we were able to hear you now. But now, now it's on mute. Uh, Dr. I... Tassos, you are on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, no, I don't... okay now? Uh... Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, did it... there is a background noise here. Well, this conference was jointly organized with the SDSN Global as part of the Rio Plus 30 Forum. Can you hear me? Yes, I think you're good now. Yes. Okay. Well, first, I'd like to thank Professor Marcel Gattas, our Vice Hector of Development and Innovation, who is representing our Hector, Father Anderson Antonio Pedroso, in this conference. Uh, Professor Gattas' short talk 
indicated the interest of Pukuhi not only on keeping, but also increasing the partnership with the SDLSM. Such partnership is in line with the Laudato Si in Pisicotal of Pope Francisco, which somehow summarizes the missions of both Pukuhiu and the SDSN on the care with the common home. In addition, we are grateful by the participation of the president and one of the founders of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who was just in front of the Brazilian embassy in Rome. I must say here that I had the pleasure to first meet Professor Sachs at the Planet Under Pressure Conference that occurred in London in March to, uh, 2012 as part of the preparation for the Rio, Rio Plus 20 conference that happened in Rio de Janeiro in June of 12, 12, uh, 12, 2012. Not surprisingly, Professor Sachs was able in a short talk to provide to us a general picture on aspects related to sustainable development, among other things, stressing the relevance of the SDSM within the diversity of actions supported or developed by the United Nations. We are particularly joyful today because this talk occurred, as far as I am concerned, exactly in the month that the SDSM becomes 10 years old. We also would like to thank all the panelists that taught us on the relevant subject of partnership cooperation funding, Alice Guimarães and Leonie Grotegoff from the German Agents for International Cooperation, Patrick Walsh from the SDG Academy, and Marcia Garcia Haro from the SDSN Secretariat. Of course, we cannot forget our dear friend and Vice President for Americas, Emma Torres, who unfortunately was unable to be among us today. Additionally, we are grateful to our colleagues panelists from SDSN Bolivia, Oscar Molina Terrerina, from Colombia at the Center for, for Latin America, Monica Pinidia, and from the SDSN USA, Sonja Neve who shared with us their experience on dealing with aspects related to university mobilization and interactions within the context of the United Nations SDGs. Special thanks are due to the SDN team, coordinated by Giovanna Bruna, our local manager from New York, and especially today to our moderator, uh, Isabella Leite. We are also grateful to the executive committee of SDS in Brazil, here represented by Rodrigo Medeiros, who introduced to us a brief history of the development of the SDSM Brazil and gave insights on future perspectives. Last but not least, we are deeply grateful to NIMA, the Environmental Interdisciplinary Nucleus of Okiriu, who Uh, shares the secretary of the STN Brazil at the, its newly named Luis Felipe Guanaz Rego Environmental Education Station. The special takes are also, are also due to Karina Flossi and Celia Kufuri, who took care of the not so easy job of simultaneous translations. Furthermore, we acknowledge the Puck Hill Communication Team and Professor Sidney Passionik, head of our Technical Scientific Center by their support in internal external divulgation of the conference. Finally, I'd like to thank the Rio de Janeiro Research Supporting Agency, FAPERGI, for its financial support to this conference, which does not end today. Indeed, this event will run for two more days, comprising virtual meetings and a further day of in-person meeting with the universities that are members of the SDSN Brazil aiming to identify synergies in teaching, research, and technological development in order to strengthen partnerships and to build a cooperative work among our institutions. Finishing this part of our 12, uh, 2022 STS and Brazil conference, I would like to state that regardless the results of the next presidential election, 
the SDSC in Brazil will work hard in the direction of reaching the 17 SDGs targets. Once more, we thank all the audience that has been following us. I wish a good day to all of you. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Dr. Tasso. Thank you, everyone.